What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. Let's throw up the rundown and get right into it. First up, Apple released a nice little marketing tool for us. As always, links are in the description, but you go in here, type in an app. Uh, you can type in your app or another app. You see, I typed in YouTube, all the variations of YouTube. We'll go to the, the OG app here. And if you scroll down, you see we get the content link, a short link. You can download the app icon or you can copy the embed, uh, app store badges, and you get some flexibility here. You can do, you know, maybe you want the Apple TV app store, right? Download an Apple TV. Maybe you want it in white. There you go. Maybe you want it in Spanish. There you go. And you can download those badges. You know, this would be more for your, your you know, marketing page, all that good stuff. Uh, and then you get a QR code to actually download your app. You can just hit generate QR code. There you go. Plain and simple. Change the color. Generate it. Uh, add icon. This is what I think looks good. So I think you definitely add the app icon. Generate the QR code. There you go. So now you can download that QR code and put it on your website, wherever you need to put it. People can scan that and go right to your app store page. So these tools aren't necessarily groundbreaking, but it's nice to see, you know, little things being added to make our lives a lot easier. Next up, we have a blog post from Sensor Tower talking about, you know, app store revenue, and they do this, you know, periodically, but you see global app revenue grew 32% year over year in Q3. And then they break it down really, you, you can really dive in. I'm gonna highlight some of the major charts here, but here's the, and, I, and I've talked about this before on like previous episodes, but for those that are new to this whole app world, this app ecosystem, in general, on average, of course, this is an absolute across every app, but in general, iOS users spend more money than Android users. And here's the, the case, right? They basically double 19 billion versus 10 billion. And if you go down to the downloads, the reason why this is kind of interesting is if you look at global downloads of mobile apps, like Google Play dominates the iOS app store. The term is like total global market share, you know, 28 billion to 8 billion. But like I said, this 8 billion downloads generates a lot more revenue than the downloads of the Play Store. So again, dig into this data, do with it what you will, um, but that's kind of the, the common theme. And of course, like I said, that's not absolute. One other thing I wanna point out is how this uh, applies to like gaming, right? They separate it out between normal apps and games. Same thing, you see the App Store is generating more revenue, about 50% more revenue here, 8.5 billion to 12.4. But look at the downloads for games. Like, oh boy, <laughs> Google Play for like free games just destroys, right? Almost 12 billion to 2.3 billion. But again, that small 2.3 billion, if you wanna call it a sliver, uh, generates a lot more revenue than the Google Play Store. So again, do with that data what you will, uh, but this is, this is more of the same. I featured this again in years past and it all basically tells the same story. iOS app users spend a lot more money than Google Play users typically. On the topic of App Store subscriptions, uh, there's a great YouTube video that I stumbled across as I was doing research for my own indie app on like how to price it and all that stuff. And th this video, I'm gonna let it play here, um, but I definitely recommend watching it. It's about 10 minutes long, but it talks about why subscriptions are good, even though like most consumers like don't like them. And you know, it comes from the software perspective of like we always have to constantly update it for like the new iOS and new features, right? Like. Basically, if a piece of software is not being updated, it's going to die eventually, right? So developers always have to update it. Again, we know all this. This is nothing new to you. But this is a video, like if we could just send all of our customers, it's probably pretty heavy handed, but I don't know. Maybe you know some people that aren't developers that don't quite get this. Um, you can send them this video. I just think it was a great explanation on why like subscriptions, as, even though most people hate them, are like kind of almost like a necessary evil. And it talks about some of the other options developers have uh, you know, to continue to make money and earn a living uh, and hey, how that is like a lot worse than the subscription model. So anyway, check it out if you're thinking about subscriptions for your app or if you have a uh, angry customer that you want subscriptions, eh, maybe send them the video. Next up, we have Drawing Trees in SwiftUI by objc.io, I never know how to say that. You can't really say objective C. Anyway, great uh, content if you're not familiar with them. I have links in the descriptions to their books. They put out great stuff. Uh, normally you have the, there's a subscription service, but this video is free. And again, it's drawing trees in Swift UI. Now, what do you mean drawing trees? Like not like an actual tree, right? So let me fast forward here to a timestamp I have. Uh, yeah, so see this kind of tree, right? And the reason I wanted to share this is because, not because you're gonna need this for an app, but one, it's a good exercise in Swift UI, and two, if you're thinking about applying at any major company and doing whiteboard interviews, like 
so many whiteboard questions are some derivation of building a tree, traversing a tree. Like there's always some sort of tree question. So if you're interested in interviewing and, and you want to kind of dabble in Swift UI and learn that a bit too, this is a nice like combination of the two skills uh, that I think you'll find very valuable. Next, I wanna share a short Twitter thread by Renard Leinart here. And this is in quotes, by the way, for those listening on the podcast. In quotes, Swift and Swift UI are a distraction. Apple should have just incrementally improved Objective-C and UI kit instead, all right, end quote. Say the people who don't realize how Apple's development ecosystem was on the decline back in 2014. Now that predates me. I joined this world back in uh, the beginning of 2015, but he continues on. Uh, Swift, if nothing else, gave a jolt of fresh air to the wider community, signifying that writing apps for iOS platforms would not be limited anymore to a choice of C-based languages from the 80s or JavaScript on top of a pile of third-party hacks. And here's where I think a lot of us can relate. It drew in a ton of young students who would have otherwise become web or Android developers. And that's true. When I first started, like I, I went the iOS route mainly because I loved Apple, but mostly because of Swift. Like I tried learning Objective-C and gave up on it. You know, I don't want to bash Objective-C, but I think a lot of people would agree it's not very welcoming to beginners. Like it's not like a fun language to learn. I don't know. Like it's not super open door welcoming. Like everybody loves it and wants to jump in. So I think based on that comment, like, cause I was also learning like web development at the time, HTML, CSS, and starting to dabble in JavaScript. If Swift doesn't come out, you know, do I continue on that path and become a web developer? Like that's a very interesting question. And I think probably, to be honest with you. But he continues on, right? It, it laid forward a path of innovation instead of stagnation. We are still clearly at the beginning of this transition. Uh, we can be hopeful for the future, right? And he says he he absolutely loves Objective-C, it remains a great language, but he says it would have never become a popular one, at least popular enough to save the Apple ecosystem over time. So I'm curious, what do you think? Do you think Swift, you know, coming out and Swift UI and this new stuff going forward is, uh, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's objectively true that it is just that, like you said, that jolt of new people, new experience, excitement um, and it kind of like revived the ecosystem. So I don't know, but love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, I think it's pretty objective, but if you have a dissenting opinion, I would love to hear it. Next up, we have a post from Traff, six figures in six days. And this is more about the iOS 14 widget craze, right? And Traff, what he did just for context, I'll click to it. He created this icon pack, a very simple, minimalist, black and white icon pack that you see here. Uh, and it got, obviously, you can see in the lower left, uh, MKBHD featured it on his channel. Wasn't a sponsored thing. He just, hey, I like this product and, and showed off how he used it for his phone. Well, as you can imagine, a, a channel of that size, totally boosted sales and he made about six figures in six days like and counting. Now, why do I wanna talk about a designer making an icon pack? Well, it's because the whole, the typical overnight success thing, right? I'm a, I'm a 10 year overnight success. So it tells a little bit about that story because I don't want, you know, cause iOS 14 widgets are creating a lot of success stories, the David Smith widget Smith. Remember, widget Smith was David Smith's 59th app. And he's been a mainstay in the iOS developer community for as long as I can remember, like 10 plus years. So. <laughs> like that overnight success is a long time coming. So there's a few highlights, definitely check this out. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but there's a few highlights that I wanna point out. Well, first of all, he was making icon packs for the jailbreak community, which, you know, isn't huge. Uh, and this kind of prepared him for as soon as he saw icons being a thing on iOS 14, like he was he was ready to jump in. Like he already has been doing it. Uh, he already had ideas. That's why he was so quick and able to put out good quality stuff. Now, uh, that's kind of the story here. We're gonna go deeper into... I don't know, maybe stuff that you can take away from this as a developer. Publish often, right? Continue putting things out into the world to create proof of work. There's only so much we can control once pushing something out into the world, but publishing often will increase your odds at finding something that sticks, right? They say fortune favors the bold. In the internet age, the bold are those that aren't afraid to publish their work for the world to see. The internet is a never ending stream of content. The idea of being annoying or oversharing is an idea that you invent to stop you from sharing. So again, that whole point, I you know, the just ship it video, like put your stuff out there. Like you never know. Again, David Smith has made 59 apps and he's been successful. Not like he was failing, like he's been successful, but on the 59th app, it blew up massively. Like there's been speculation on how much he's made off Widget Smith. I don't want to join into that, but I think we can all agree it's a significant amount of money off of that. So again, just keep putting your stuff out there. And then two more points I want to make from this article. Uh, one, charge more, right? If I would have asked anyone what, the, I don't know if you saw this up here, 28 bucks in the upper right for an icon pack. Many, many may balk at that. Like, wow, why would anyone pay that? Well, remember your opinion is not the market, right? The market kind of like decides all. And Apparently six figures in six days, 
$28 is a fine price point. All right, back to this, right? If I would have asked anyone what the price is at, most would have said $2, maybe five. You know what I mean? So like pricing is so tricky and, and it's kind of our fault where we put ourselves in, you know, as a whole and developers by charging nothing for our products. Like we've kind of trained our, our market to not pay or not value the work we put in. And now we're kind of like in trouble for that. Cause if you charge anything over 99 cents for an app, you, you get shit on, right? So anyway, pricing is, is so hard. I'm not going to act like it's easy, but just don't automatically default to 99 cents or $1, right? Think about your, you know, your market and all that good stuff. Anyway, pricing's hard, not gonna lie. And then the last thing on this one here is uh, we can see all the stats and all that stuff. Um, the best part about this is the freedom it bought me to keep building things that'll create even more freedom. Spending time on the things that will buy you time is always a good use of it. And what I took from that, and, and this is this is my whole goal, the reason why I went full-time YouTube and all that stuff is like, like that's the dream, right? Like sure, many of you may say, oh, my dream is to work at Apple. My dream is to work at YouTube, Google, whatever. But I think your real dream, and I'm, I know I'm speaking for you, but I think your real dream is to take this software developer skill, build whatever the hell you want, whatever you find fun, and have that product, whatever you build, have some sort of audience, and you being able to make a living off the stuff that you just have fun building, right? Not working for a company, not building somebody else's app. Like that's the dream. So again, kind of to pull this all full circle is like putting your own work out there, sharing it, taking shots, taking a little bit of chances. I'm not saying go all in and risk your whole career, but you know, take chances on side projects and you never know, it could be the thing that ends up buying you your freedom to work on whatever the hell you wanna work on, whenever you wanna work on it. And to me, that's the dream. Now that we've talked about winning the lottery and going viral, which many of you may have been thinking about that last article, let's kind of bring it back down to earth real quick. And that's this article from Jordan Morgan. Jordan shares all his indie stuff, I love it. It says, the chart that lies. And to sum it up, basically this, right? Time spent, you know, the more time you spend, the more effort you put in, the more your chance of success. It's not, doesn't quite work like that. Of course, you know, effort, time spent in, that helps, but there's more to it, right? And so he, Jordan here talks about how in the indie world, it's, it's basically tough to make it. It's tough to make money, right? For example, right, the biggest names in publishing are manning marketing machines to accomplish the very same goals that you are as one person. And like we talked about last time, consumers have been taught by us, no doubt, that they really don't need to pay us anything to gain value from the things we make. The apps that they did to take a chance on possibly left a terrible taste in their mouth. And of course, you're putting up your creation as a thousand new entries a day, talking about the competition on the app store. And down here, uh, th that description doesn't exactly make for a good one sheet. Uh, the point is the time I'm spending developing my app, and this is important, commercially speaking, could be time wasted because it is tough to make it on the app store, right? But here's the, the main reason I wanted to share this and kind of the lesson to take away, right? Uh, well, first he talks about the realistic chart, which is you need to have a quality app, market fit, timing, exposure, and that hard work and effort. Like there's so many factors that go into success and luck, to be honest, uh, that it's just not working hard that will get you there. Like you gotta do a lot more. But all right, back to the main takeaway here. And that is uh, the part that keeps me motivated though, is that you as the indie, you get to define what success looks like. And I'll use me as an example of this, right? The indie app I'm making, if it sells zero copies, it's a complete commercial failure. Well, one, I will have learned how to make an iPad OS app and Mac app, which will help me in my future content. It'll generate a ton of content for the YouTube channel, right? That's, that's the worst case scenario, which is still, that's a success to me. And then of course it can get better. Maybe it can make a substantial side income if it does succeed. And then like the super successful thing is it goes crazy. It does very, very well. And I can build a startup around it. But again, you get to define what success looks like. And I am, I consider any of those outcomes successful. So to me, that says, yes, build that app. Like there's no reason not to build it. So when you're building your project, like think to yourself, like, you know, define your success. Uh, so anyway, great article by Jordan. Go ahead and read that if you need to come down from the previous articles, like crazy lottery winnings. <laughs> Next up, I wanna share a new YouTube channel called How It's Built uh, by Zosh here. And he brings on people to talk really in depth about like the architecture of their app, how they built it. Like, as you can see, it's 48 minutes long. So this is like no joke, but if you really wanna dive into the nitty gritty details, I recommend it. And thankfully, uh, just like you can see here on Swift News, he uses the timestamps in Swift to uh, basically break it down chapter by chapter. It might be too small for you to read, but this is like core ar architecture section. There's a section on Swift on the server. Here's networking section, uh, in-app navigation. And here like it basically talks about how the app works, how the app navigates. You know, you get diagrams broken down on like how they did it. So again, really uh, nitty gritty on how things are built. So if you're interested in, again, how the apps are built, the architecture behind it, 
uh, and you have an hour to invest in it, I highly recommend checking out this channel. This is the first episode, how it's built. You can see 134 subscribers, but uh, hopefully more to come, uh, more interesting stuff to teach us all. And finally, AR Corner here. I just wanted to share this because it looked insanely real. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know if it comes across on the YouTube video, but like, it looks crazy real. And then you'll see here in a second, like, it's not. It's AR. Like, ah, it's insane. Anyway, you know how I feel about AR. It's going to be crazy when you're wearing those glasses. Anyway, that's all for this week's episode. We'll catch you in the next one.